I love the Old Testament book of Proverbs. I've had a long-term love affair with the book, and I can't get away from it. I love reading a proverb, breaking down its structure, and gleaning its obvious truth and instruction. But I also love digging deeper for subtle word plays and discovering additional insights and applications. It's my hope that as we go through this series of lessons that you too will fall in love with Proverbs. Hello, my name is Sean Tyler, and I welcome you to this Bible study series on the Old Testament wisdom book of Proverbs. As a missionary for the past 30 years, I've had the opportunity to teach many Bible courses. The first time I taught a series on Proverbs was in 2003. As soon as I began to dig into the book preparing for the course, I fell in love with it. What I have done for this series is to take my classroom notes and supplement each lesson with pictures, graphs, maps, and scripture quotes. As we work our way through this series, I want to encourage you to use each lesson as an opportunity to ask questions and add to your own understanding by discussing the lesson with those watching this series with you. You will gain a lot more from this series if you actively seek to add to your knowledge by engaging those studying with you. So let's start this series with a general introduction about wisdom literature, and let's frame it with a question. How did a non-literate society educate and transmit its wisdom to the next generation so that general life lessons could be remembered and utilized? A non-literate society could not rely on scrolls, books, newspapers, computers, or digitally stored information. A non-literate society had to have another way. According to scholars, the main way a non-literate society transmitted its wisdom was orally. In the ancient days, the ways most often used to encapsulate life's truths or beliefs were through stories. Sometimes these stories were called myths. Occasionally, stories would be performed as plays. Greek dramas as far back as 550 B.C. to 200 B.C. were written during religious festivals by famous playwrights such as Aeschylus and Euripides. These often illustrated societal truth, a life principle or religious moral. A second way was songs. Songs were often written to tell of a historical battle, an epic struggle against powerful enemies, or to praise a warrior or describe an important relationship or event. This is exactly what Moses and Miriam did in Exodus 15, after God saved the Israelites from the Egyptian army by drowning Pharaoh's troops in the Red Sea, a song was taught to the Israelites exalting God for their salvation in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 to 21. Often songs were paired with dancing for harvest festivals, national days of celebration, and religious ceremonies to praise, appease, or solicit favors from the gods. These songs were important ways to teach and transmit beliefs and principles to the next generation. Proverbs was another major way of transmitting truths. A proverb is a short, well-written statement, sometimes humorous, that connects a common understanding or experience to a meaningful life principle or insight. The proverb serves as a memory device to capture truths in short sentences that can be remembered and applied at the proper time. They're like signposts, giving directions for wise social responses. Consider for a moment King Solomon. He was the third king of Israel and lived in a time when his people were mostly non-literate, but where scribes could write down important information. If Solomon were to set his mind to collect the wisdom of his age, what would he do? He could set a goal to collect and write down all the stories of his people. However, Moses had done this in a collection of writings we call the Pentateuch. Perhaps Solomon could gather all the songs of his people. However, his father, King David, had already done this, creating a national songbook we call the Book of Psalms. 
Well, then, Solomon could set a goal to collect all the proverbs of Israel and supplement them with appropriate proverbs from neighboring countries. By collecting all the proverbs he could find into one book, Solomon would be gathering all the known oral wisdom about life, family, community, business, social justice, friendship, industriousness, and how to conduct oneself before others. Compiling all this wisdom into one collection, and having it for his own personal use, Solomon would be considered the wisest man upon the face of the earth. Some scholars believe Solomon's collection of Proverbs later became a teaching tool or primer for young men selected and groomed for court work before the king, or as ambassadors representing the king in foreign countries. This theory is very convincing, since Proverbs is so practically oriented for royal and social contexts. Learning the wisdom of Proverbs in the ancient days would prepare a young man so that he could conduct himself respectably in all situations. It would be the perfect grooming aid for the king's attendants and officials. The tradition of using Proverbs as a schoolbook for young men evidently continued well into the exilic and post-exilic times when Israel no longer had a king. There is some indication that Proverbs became a schoolbook to train young men in how to conduct themselves successfully in life. I believe this also means that Proverbs would be an excellent collection of wisdom sayings for any person in any age to prepare themselves for spiritual, business, social, and family success. After studying Proverbs for many years, I'm convinced these wisdom sayings should be taught in public schools every day as a foundation for common sense wisdom. Neglecting them, I think, is one of our modern society's greatest mistakes. Let's stop for a moment and consider the proper application of Proverbs in daily life. Memorizing a set of Proverbs and the principles they represent is only half the journey to real wisdom. Real wisdom, however, lies in learning how to apply the right proverb or principle in a given situation. Let me illustrate this with a hammer. Most people have held a hammer at one time or another. Many have seen a hammer being used by a carpenter or builder. The key to using a hammer is knowing which end of the hammer is needed at a given time. Does one need the head for hitting a nail or the claw for pulling out the nail? The right end at the right time properly utilizes the hammer. This is a very simple illustration, but it makes my point clearly. Consider two proverbs found in chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, as they teach opposite responses to a fool. Verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. However, verse 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. These two proverbs, placed next to each other, seemingly teach contradictory responses to a fool. Such contrasting instructions placed back to back may confuse the new reader or student of Proverbs, and they may ask, so which one is correct? The answer is, both are correct, depending upon the circumstances. There will be a time when a wise man should avoid getting into an argument or discussion with a fool. It would only bring misery instead of benefit. This would especially be true if the wise man seeks to teach, instruct, or correct the foolish person in the middle of his folly. Then there are times when it would be wise to answer a fool. While the fool may not take advice or learn anything from the exchange, it would be good for him to know that not all people accept his opinions, believe his words, or agree with his stated values. These two proverbs are like the two parts of the hammer. Knowing which one to use at a given time is true wisdom. Let me emphasize the second part of the truth I just stated. Knowing many proverbs does not make you a wise person. Using them correctly makes you a wise person. Consider the warning of Proverbs chapter 26, verse 7. This warning comes just two verses after the two opposing proverbs about the fool. It says, Like a lame man's legs that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. In this proverb, the lame legs are paralleled with a proverb. The life truth taught in this proverb is clear. The inability to use his legs makes a man lame. 
The spiritual principle gained is equally clear. The inability to wisely use a proverb makes a man a fool. Even though a man has internalized a proverb and can accurately quote it, his inability to properly apply it or live by it makes him a fool. I have lived in East Africa for a long time. My experience shows that many people in East African cultures function as though they live in non-literate societies, and these people are filled with proverbs that are well known and often quoted as guides to cultural wisdom. Most Africans I know possess few books or computers, though this is changing with the younger generations. They have traditionally gathered most of their information orally. They love stories and enjoy singing and they really enjoy the wisdom of a humorous proverb. Let me share with you a few of my favorite African proverbs. One Malawian proverb says, One does not go twice between the legs of an elephant. This is, humorous. This is a humorous mental picture, reminding us how difficult it is to flirt with danger without suffering for it. No wise person would willingly repeat the same dangerous experience. Another Malawian proverb says, a quarrelsome chief does not hold a village together. This is an excellent insight into the importance of patient, fair, and compassionate leadership. African community experience proves that unity will be destroyed by a quarrelsome leader. The truth is also easily evident today in world politics. A Ugandan proverb says, Those who argue while cutting poles cannot build together. Using poles has traditionally been the most common way of building a mud and wattle house. Ugandan wisdom understands that if those who join together in an effort argue, it's unlikely they will work together long enough to successfully achieve their common goal. Unity and consensus are key factors in success. A Zimbabwean proverb reminds us of a common human tendency. It says, The axe forgets, but the cut leg does not. This proverb accurately reflects human nature. He who offends another quickly forgets his wrong, but he who is wounded does not easily forget his hurt. Both tendencies will affect how each acts and responds to the other in the future. And I've discovered in my interaction with world religions that Christianity is unique in that it teaches the importance of extending forgiveness. A Ghanaian proverb, I think, is extremely insightful concerning leadership especially national leadership. It says, An army of sheep led by a lion can defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. Today, protests are breaking out all over the world because people are tired of the lack of courage and willingness by their leaders to do the right thing. People are suffering because they have sheep for leaders and not lions. Another excellent, insightful African proverb says, a camel does not tease another camel about its hump. It is human nature that those who share the same belief, hold the same value, or struggle with the same problem tend to band together because they have something in common. This is especially true of evil people. A thief will not quickly condemn another thief, but rather plead for leniency or forgiveness. Over the last 50 years, African politicians have struggled to eliminate corruption from their governments. It seems one corrupt politician cannot bring himself to punish another corrupt politician, for they both have the same kind of hump. One of my favorite proverbs comes from southern Sudan. It says, If you are not strong, do not kick the buttocks of an elephant. <laughs> the absurdity and obvious danger of running up behind an elephant and kicking it makes the student of this proverb laugh. The teaching is obvious and memorable. Before engaging any enemy, make sure you have accurately gauged his strength and avoid beginning a quarrel with someone who can easily crush you. When I was young, I often heard my parents and grandparents quote a proverb or saying, Today I seldom hear proverbs quoted in my culture. 
Is this a commentary on modern Western society? Think about it for a minute. Western society's store of wisdom has become external in the form of books, computers, the internet, calculators, cell phones, GPS units, iPads, and other such devices. Individuals are not encouraged to internalize knowledge. Even keys to life principles, organization, ordering our personal habits, or just discernment for life's choices are written in self-help books. When I check out at a supermarket, I notice today's attendants must punch in the amount of money I give them and wait for the cash register to show the balance before they know how much change to give me. Twenty years ago, everyone knew several phone numbers by memory. Today, most people rely on the information stored inside their cell phones. And when the phone is lost or stolen, they're stranded until they can gather up the numbers again. Without internalizing knowledge and guiding principles, I believe individuals will struggle to make good decisions. They will find it hard to discern what is right or wrong, and many will make personal and social mistakes, especially if external information is not available at the moment of need or advice is misleading. The memorization of Scripture and Proverbs develops an internal store of wisdom that can be easily accessed and used at all times, and especially in times of need. Perhaps this is the reason behind so many encouragements in Proverbs to memorize or internalize its teachings. Often Proverbs promotes the acquisition of wisdom as both external and internal adornment. Listen to these words from Proverbs. Listen to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teachings. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Again, Store up my commands within you. And the next verse, turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Another encouragement is found in chapter 3, verse 3. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Chapter 6, verse 21 says, Bind them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. By obeying these admonitions, chapter 6, verse 22 describes what will happen to the student who internalizes the wisdom of Proverbs. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. In fact, no other book in the Bible encourages memorization or the internalization of its content more than the wisdom of Proverbs. Today's literate societies seem to be relying less and less on internalized Proverbs and principles. They appear to me to be on the brink of losing their oral, proverbial wisdom as a guide for life's choices. Will dependency upon the Internet, computers, and other external devices really be good for us? Will we become a foolish society incapable of making good decisions without the aid of external resources? And who is it that determines what should be kept on the Internet and how it is written? Will people simply become puppets speaking and acting as others wish? My goals for this study in Proverbs are to provide an overview and structure of the book of Proverbs to enhance our understanding, study, and application of its wisdom to provide a guideline on how to identify different kinds of proverbs and to reap the fullest meaning from each, to build our appreciation and love for proverbs and the wisdom it contains, to alert us all to the need of internalizing key principles, proverbs, and wisdom to aid us in discerning right from wrong so that we can make better and more godly decisions for success in life. Let me give one corrective warning about this study. Proverbs portrays God as firmly in control of the universe. The Proverbs are stated as absolutes without exception. Follow God's principles and you will succeed. Proverbs is ideal, orderly, clear-cut, with right and wrong clearly defined. 
In other wisdom literature of the Old Testament, the books of Job and Ecclesiastes portray life as messy, chaotic, a vaporous smoke, and meaningless, where bad things happen to good people for unexplained reasons. The Bible places Proverbs together with Job and Ecclesiastes, and indeed right in the very middle of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament for a reason. They are expected to balance each other. In fact, I believe Proverbs acts as a compass to direct us to moral truth and wisdom. Proverbs represents truths and principles that generally work out as taught. However, Job teaches us that sometimes bad things can happen even when you're doing what is right. Job addresses the exceptions to the rules. But just because there are exceptions does not mean that we should neglect the rules, for they work out the majority of the time. So Proverbs should be studied, and its teachings should be incorporated into life. However, any study of Proverbs should be tempered with the understanding that there are exceptions. Thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope it has been enlightening for you and that already your interest in Proverbs is growing. Join me for the next lesson as we begin an introduction to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Until next time.